Social media's impact is profound in today's culture with positive and negative effects across multiple platforms. Today, we'll take a closer look at how apps like Uber, Snapchat, and SoundCloud have changed the dynamics of our society. Stay tuned for all this and more on this week's special edition of the Report Program. Welcome to this week's class edition of the Report Program, where we give you news, views, and information to go. I'm Jessica Lucero. I'm Alyssa Ruiz. And I'm Jorian Goldbach. This week we have a special edition of the program focusing on social media and the way it shapes our society. Social media today plays a large role in keeping businesses up and running for many entrepreneurs. Food Beast is, food, is a food news website that, just like many companies, relies on social media to gain followers. Reporter Mark Shamali spoke with the owner to learn more about how exactly social media has helped the company tremendously. Since social media began to service on the internet, many people have found ways to utilize their services in order to create a business or help run one. From advertising retail goods on platforms such as Instagram and Snapchat, to streaming live on Facebook or Twitch, social media has opened up many doors for entrepreneurs to take advantage of in helping run their business. Today, social media is one of the top platforms for receiving the news. Food Beast, a food news website, has utilized multiple forms of social media such as Facebook and Instagram in order to get their content to reach as many viewers as possible. They have created multiple videos posted on Facebook and YouTube that have gone viral. I spoke with Eli A. Ruth, owner of Food Beast, and asked him more about how Facebook helped with gaining more readers. Here's what he had to say. Once we started putting our videos on YouTube, Facebook, then Instagram, we've had months where we'll get 100 million video viewers a month. And we couldn't have that scale on our own. It's definitely a, a big nod to Facebook's big, I mean, there's 2 billion people on Facebook. There's over a billion people on YouTube. So they have an ecosystem where if you just do cool content that people need, you'll have an audience for it. Although Food Beast is a food news company, one of their most popular releases is a video of how to properly eat a Tic Tac. When this video went viral on Facebook, Food Beast saw a massive increase in readers. Go to foodbeast.com to see all your latest food news. I'm Mark Tramali with The Report Program. Uber was invented in 2009 and Lyft was invented in 2012. Since then, the ride-sharing services have served lots of rides in the streets of downtown Fullerton. Our very own Jessica Lucero took to the streets to see if drunk driving has gone down in our hometown since the ride-sharing apps were founded. Ride-sharing services such as Uber and Lyft have been around since 2009. Since then, an article by the New York Times reported that New York City has had up to a 35% reduction in alcohol-related car accidents. But what about the rest of the country? It seems the ratio of Uber and Lyft drivers to people that are out and drinking is still very off balance, so much so that there has not been an overall effect just yet. I asked an avid Lyft consumer the most popular time that she chooses to use their ride-sharing service. Like a night out, or like before I'm gonna go out, that's basically it. Yeah. While CNN reported that there are hundreds of thousands of drivers that clock into Uber each month, there are still 4.2 million people who continuously drive drunk every month. I had the chance to speak with Fullerton Police Department's John Radis about whether he believes there has been a decrease in drunk driving since Uber and Lyft have been around. So it's really difficult to uh, put a number on whether or not drunk driving has decreased with Uber and Lyft. We certainly see a number of Uber and Lyft drivers in the downtown area during the nighttime hours when there are people uh, going to the bars. Uh, but whether or not there's been a decrease is, is, is hard to substantiate. We certainly have seen an increase in drunk driving and DUI related um, accidents and crashes. 
While some parts of New York City may have had a decrease in drunk driving accidents, the rest of the country is still facing a plateau, and it's going to take much more than a $10 two-mile drive to help change the irrational thoughts of a drunken driver. People seeing their friends that are drunk and saying, hey, we should not be driving, let's call Uber or Lyft, just making good decisions. For the Report Program, I'm Jessica Lucero. With the age of the internet, memes have become the most popular form of humor across all social medias. These little cartoons with reactionary misattributed quotes can go viral and have the potential to make a ton of money. But these jokes are being stolen and the thieves are, be are profiting. Our own Robbie King has more. But memes are funny. That's one of the things that, <laughs> like, a good solid meme. Memes. The lifeblood of millennial social media. Whether people think the country is falling apart or the world is on the edge of nuclear holocaust, for some nihilistic reason, millennials are being funny about it. Lots of individuals on the internet create this new form of Dadaism. But where it goes sour is when capitalism steps in and people try to profit off others. Twitter accounts, like all the different common white girls or Dory, and the social media giant the Fat Jew, are all violators of joke stealing. They claim the openness of the internet allows them to curate these memes, but when they are making enormous amounts of money, who's really running the show? On his podcast, The Joe Rogan Experience, comedian Joe Rogan talks about this. Well, it's also people have turned into a business. Yeah. Like the meme business is a business. And then they have sponsored uh, sponsored uh, Instagram posts and sponsored tweets. Yeah. And they make a lot of money. Like there's a lot of money to be made. And people were getting these development deals to do television shows and all sorts of other things based on the content of other people's ideas that they're just aggregating. In an interview with Dan Rather, Josh Sotrovsky, a.k.a. the Fat Jew, as his Instagram is known, attempts to explain himself. Joke feeds. Right. True? No. Well, it's not, the internet is not like that. It's not that type of medium. It's, this is not about, I'm not necessarily a comedian. I'm a, I'm a curator. And now anytime, you know, if you look at, like, for the most part, anytime you look at something that's on there, there, there is a citation. So what can be done? Unfortunately, like independent music, it's up to the consumer to make sure that the meme creator is the one getting the credit and making the money. Twitter accounts like Kale Salad is probably the best at giving credit. Rarely does he tweet for himself, but all his account does is retweet the originally funny tweet before Bo Dory or Common White Girl can steal it. He's aware of stealing of other people's work and is someone who's finally doing something about it. I'm Robbie King for The Report Program. Aspiring R&B artist December spoke about how social media has influenced his career, using it to promote his music and network with others in the industry. Our reporter Alyssa Ruiz has more. As social media continues to be a key component to life in the 21st century, users take pleasure in hundreds of different applications and for different reasons. Up-and-coming R&B artist Kyle Williams, also known by his stage name December, explains how social media has helped influence his career. Definitely reaching out to a lot of people uh, across the world so easily, so simply. I went to Lebanon and... Um, I'm about to go to Poland. All those people contacted me through you know, my Instagram. Instagram is one of the world's most used social media sites, reaching over 800 million active users, and is only one of the many sites December uses to connect with fans and promote his music. My SoundCloud and everything, and being able to share links and drop links on different pages and stuff. On SoundCloud, they actually have a, a feature that lets you see how many people listen to your song in one city or one country around the world. And so I'm able to keep track of, you know, where outside of my own country that I get, you know, interest from and stuff like that. So it's really cool to see different types. Following in his father's and his grandfather's footsteps by pursuing music, December explains the advantages social media has given him to be more successful in the industry. Social media puts that power in your hands to do it on your own. If you really take the time and, you know, try to understand how it works and all that stuff. It's just crazy how accessible like the world is. It makes the world so small, just from your phone. It's crazy. As December continues to work on his first album coming out in February, he is focusing on the new music he is releasing next month. I'm Alyssa Ruiz for The Report Program. You know, I have a question.
question. Why is he named December? Was his birthday in, is his birthday in December or something? Actually, very funny that you asked me that because his birthday is in fact in December. All right, <laughs> it all makes sense now. It does. <laughs> it's so cool that Fullerton residents are doing stuff like this. Yeah. After our break, uh, after our break, we will get some advice from an expert about social media and stay studying. Stay tuned. Oh, that sucks. Welcome back guys. Snapchat, Twitter, and other social media applications make it possible to keep track of those you really care about. But as students does too much time online negatively affect grades, our reporter Terry Gaines spoke with a professor on campus with knowledge on the subject. Social media websites and applications like Snapchat and Instagram have made it possible to keep track of what's going on in the lives of those you care about. For students particularly, it provides an escape from the everyday stressors of school, work, and other responsibilities. But what impact does social media have on your obligations as a student? Does it take away your focus? Ofer Terrell, professor of information systems and decision sciences, recently conducted a study on how social media relates to the impulsive and reflective systems in the brain. I spoke with him to get more information. It is an accelerator that drives motion, motivation to act, upon some cues from the environment. So when you hear your cell phone beeps, like mine just beeped now, you are motivated to act upon it and check it. Then there is another system. Its job is to actually prevent you from doing something you're not supposed to do. This is called the inhibition system or self-control system. And when there is an imbalance between these two systems, we have problematic behaviors. When the inhibition system is weak, addictive behaviors can arise. Impulsive system, the one, the one that drives motivation to engage in certain rewarding behaviors, is very strong. Every time you have a cue related to using your social media, you automatically try to engage in social media use, then you have a problem. And this problem is exacerbated when the inhibition system, the self-control system, is very weak. Time management and self-control, he says, are key factors to finding a healthy balance. It's more about self-control, and in terms of balance, social media is like food in many cases. We cannot avoid using it. We want to use it, we need to use it in many cases, but we want to use it very, very cautiously and be very um, informed about the risks of overusing social media. With social media's ever-increasing popularity, students will have to try their best to stay focused. I'm Terry Gaines with the Report Program. Social media is one of the main reasons causing student stress in today's society. Our reporter Sochi Lagunas has more. It's not a surprise for social media to be one of the main reasons causing students stress in today's society. According to the American Psychological Association, research shows that the percentage of young adults using social media increased to 90% in 2015, compared to 12% in 2005. Students at Valley High School had a chance to share their stress experiences while using social media. What doesn't what stresses me out is just that, like how gossip goes around or how people like spread rumors. Instagram, I think it stresses it stresses me out because sometimes I want to show my friends something funny. And like sometimes the messages don't load and like that stresses me out. Justin Wynn, a sophomore at Cal State Fullerton, shares what made him delete Snapchat. I actually deleted my Snapchat because I was a bit insecure about why people were posting all about their lives and why I wasn't a part of it. But after that, like since deleting it, I felt pretty comfortable around people again. Jeanette Lomelli, who is the Nicholas Academic Center's Assistant Director of Mentoring and Social Services, shares some advice that will help many students stay away from stress. 
when you know that you have time to, okay, I'm gonna spend 15 minutes just browsing, catching up on my news, catching up with my friends during final seasons or even midterms. I know it's very stressful. I would say just remove the app from your phone altogether. It'll help you focus on your work and when you're done with the finals, it'll be there again for you so you can catch up with all your social media. Sochi Lagunas reporting for the report program. With depression and anxiety growing rapidly among college students, reporter Nicole Keene decided to see if social media was a contributing factor in the downfall of students' mental health. This is the sound of social media, the modern day soundtrack of young teens and millennials. College students consume most of their day looking at their cell phones, many right before bedtime. Researchers say cell phone use before bed could also lead to sleep deprivation, academic failure, and an increase in car accidents. Excessive use of cell phone and social media can not only affect your physical health, but also greatly affect your mental health. Experts say that while many students are posting highlight reels of the perfect college experience, they're also hiding their struggles, anxiety, and depression. Researchers at Stanford University call this the duck syndrome, referring to the way a duck appears to glide effortlessly across the water while underwater its feet work frantically to stay afloat. And with more college students diagnosed with depression and 75% of mental health conditions beginning before the age of 24, college has become such a critical time for today's youth. Cal State Fullerton communications major John Antonio explains how he utilizes social media and the effects he's seen on the people around him. I personally haven't had experiences with me dealing with negativity of social media, but however, I do have friends that I do know have been affected negatively with caused by depression and body shaming on social media whenever they post pictures on Instagram or Facebook, they just get negative comments and backlash about it and obviously it affects them uh, in a big way because it's things that are very hurtful, things that probably should not even said behind a computer. So obviously just it's you know, the negativity is just not good. Experts say the best advice if you're feeling anxious or stressed from cell phone use or social media content, take a walk, talk it out with a friend, or seek professional guidance from a counselor or school psychologist. Reporting for the report program, I'm Nicole King. Thanks to social media, people are now able to communicate with anyone from all over the world. However, some people believe it has also made it difficult because we're now relying too much on our devices to even talk to someone in the same room. Reporter Clarita Rico has more on the subject. Thanks to the rise in technology, the world has evolved a lot faster. And now, thanks to social media, the world has become a lot smaller. Social networks allow people the opportunity to reconnect with old or new friends and even meet people from all over the world. Users can communicate with someone from a whole other country just with an app from their phone. Apps such as Instagram and Snapchat open the doors for fast and easy communication with people from all parts of the world. And although it seems this new advancement has really closed the gap between countries, to some people, social networking has really created new gaps in other areas. According to Pilar Cordova, a student at Cal State Fullerton, social media has actually taken away the social part in communities, as people are beginning to rely too much on their computers and cell phones to talk to other people. I think it's more negative than positive, you know, because we do, it's just like a whole other world, and I think that like electronics used to be like an, ex an escape of like the world, like reality, and like now it's like, like the real world is like an escape from your phone, you know, like mm -hmm. people are like, oh, I'm gonna go like outside instead of like, you know, watching TV or like being on the phone. Like it's also just become like such a necessary part of life. Although Cordova encourages taking a break from social media by deleting the apps and not logging on to them, there has not been any real solution as to solve this constant need for people to be on their devices. At least, not yet. Who knows, maybe someone will create an app for that. This is Claire Tsarico for the report. Social media has made it easier for photographers and models to show their talent for the whole world to see. Now it has become a popularity contest to see who has the most followers and likes. 
Is the passion of photography still there or do people just post for the likes? Reporter Sharon Cardona looks for answers. Instagram has become a powerful tool for photographers and models to have their work viewed by thousands. But there's this pressure to have the most followers and likes to prove that their work is valid. I went to a photography meetup in downtown LA hosted by LA Shooters where anyone can volunteer to be a model and photographers can shoot away. I was curious to see how many likes and followers each person had. Right now I just hit a 3k mark and uh, per picture I hit around 200 to like 600 likes. Just like 3,000, like 3,600 around there. Around 2,000 followers, 2,100 and usually around each post gets around 200 likes around there. About 14,000 um, and per picture I get like 1,000 to like 3,000 likes. Well I have 1,300 something, almost uh, 1.4k and a picture I probably get like 200, 300. But what are their reactions if they don't get the likes they anticipated on their page? When I have less likes I feel, I feel like when I see the photos I already know what's gonna what's gonna be there and what's not like I already know but I'll post it anyway because I think it's good and then when the likes come it's kind of like you know I expected this I don't really care for them too much but you know it's it just it shows me more of like what people are into and what people are not into I could care less about likes because I know people will follow me regardless of how many likes I have just because I'm confident of on what I do and what my style is. It's definitely about the following and how many likes you get about on a picture and stuff so it's definitely like that's what um, determines if you get a gig or if you get sponsored or anything like that. I'm here at the Art District in downtown LA where everyone is just finishing up from their photo meetup. There was a lot of models. It was just incredible to see people just taking pictures, networking, and making new friends, gaining experience. Uh, my name is Sharon Cardona and back to you at the report. Do you guys feel like you're better photographers now that you have Instagram? I like to think I am. <laughs> I, I love Instagram. I love taking pictures and posting so I mean I'm not a professional but it's fun to think I am. By no means am I a professional. <laughs> but you know what I do find really funny about the whole subject is that they, they've always had these pop-up shops for like boutiques and whatnot, but now they have pop-up shops specifically for Instagram and for, you know, models and photographers and whatnot. My cousin actually just posted one on Instagram. How funny. <laughs> this place called The Happy Place in LA. It's really cool. They just have like a bunch of backdrops for you to take pictures at. Oh, wow. so yeah. I want to go. It's really interesting <laughs> to, in today's world. Yeah. Uh, when we come back, we will examine how dating is changing thanks to new sites and apps. Bye bye. Hi. Hoping for a crisp breeze to help keep you alert. Oh, oh, he took a sip of water too. That'll probably help. You were probably going to turn down the radio too, so you could focus, right? Probably okay isn't okay. Right? If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. I think the water line is what really drove it home. I blew on them. Welcome back. Gone are the days of cruising bars trying to find a date. Technology makes it easier to meet up with people with just the touch of your finger, without even meeting them in person. But do people really find that the best way to find love? Reporter Mia Agraviador has the story. More and more college students are meeting people on dating apps such as Tinder and Bumble. According to a Pew Research, the number of millennials ages 18 to 24 who use online dating apps have tripled since 2013. Tinder reported that 80% of people use the app to find a meaningful relationship. But while the research says young people use dating apps, many have a different opinion about it. I feel like it's more... I, I would like to meet someone in real... like. Beforehand, like not through the app and not the talking, like 
through an app. Um, I'd rather meet them naturally through person. And I feel personally, I feel like when you get like those dating apps, you're really just kind of like trying too hard to get like I don't know a relationship or whatever you're looking for. And that, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's just that maybe that's what you really want. They have a ten tendency to objectify people, and so you know you swipe right, swipe left, you base them uh, solely upon their looks or sexuality or something like that. And so that's usually probably the thing from a guy's standpoint that initially draws you to somebody's oh, they're their appearance in some way, they're sexy, they're this or that, and that's kind of your determination of pursuing somebody rather than any sort of character or anything like that. And so I imagine long term it's, it's damaging. But some feel different about the apps and will still opt meeting face to face with people. Apps are a great way to meet people because sometimes it's hard to find you know, the niche and meeting people that way, but I do prefer the old fashioned way of meeting people. I think they're a good idea, they're good for some people. Me, personally, I've never really used them, um, never really been interested, um, but I know a lot of people who are, a lot of friends that are in relationships because of them. Um, so obviously they work. I, and I'm not opposed to not using them. I think like maybe in the future I will, but I've never, it's never really been something that I like really was interested in trying. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I mean, obviously they work. I know a lot of people who are in relationships because of them. So um, obviously they're doing something right. <laughs> we now live in a world where people can meet each other without relying on chance. But despite some naysayers, dating apps are here to stay. For the report, I'm Mia Agraviador. Being in a long-distance relationship may seem difficult, uh, seem, may seem like a difficult thing to do. However, using apps like Snapchat and FaceTime can make it easier. Tyra Majors has the report. Long-distance relationships may seem like the hardest thing to survive. However, with social media apps and even FaceTime, bonds have grown stronger. Studies show that more than 800,000 long-distance couples use FaceTime daily. We are texting every day. We FaceTime every night before bed. And I think like that's what has made like, our relationship so strong. And we're just everyone says communication is key. It really is, especially mm -hmm. long-distance relationships. So we talk all the time 24 7. Oh. <laughs> it's FaceTime just about every day to communicate with each other just to see each other face to face. I think as far as like Instagram and Snapchat like I get to see we get to see each other's pictures every once in a while and then Snapchat we might send each other funny videos like just us both at work or her at school. Studies showed that 50,000 couples reported their partner's jealousy when watching their Snapchats. So Snapchat probably is like the biggest one. Um, I go out to like the bars and stuff and I have like a lot of guy friends like from my childhood and stuff. So when he sees like me in a Snapchat with like guys and stuff, you know, a million things run through his head. And he doesn't know them personally because he lives in Alabama. So he'll text me and be like, who is that guy? Like, why is he wearing your jacket? Because like, I'll just like, throw my jacket to like, my guy friends because I'm hot, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? But he just like thinks worst case scenario. He's not like super insecure, but like mm -hmm. I can see why that'd be annoying. So if I see one girl next we both have our kind of like, who is that kind of moments, you know, us being separated. We just kind of want to know who the people are around us. I think more so for me, I'm like, who is that guy? I don't trust no guy. I got to meet him first. Da -da -da -da. And her, she's like, yeah, it's like, if, I'll say if a girl probably, like, gets too close, then she starts questioning, but she does, she's less worried than I am. At the end, it's all about trust. This is Tyra Majors with the Report Program. Teams seem to be spending most of their time on social media in search for popularity and fame. Reporter Victor Cholico has more on the story. Whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, or YouTube, it is guaranteed that teens are on at least one of these platforms. A way to share photos, videos, and communicate with friends can turn into an addiction, causing teens to constantly check their social media platforms. The social media I use is Instagram, and it's usually a good amount, well, I don't know, like, it's like I go off, but then I go back on just for the fun of it. Social media platform is using Snapchat and I use it about 10 hours because that's why I usually communicate with my friends. But why are teens constantly uploading and checking their accounts? Well, it's all about the likes. The more, the better. When it comes to the likes, even I have go through that before, but like I feel like they want more likes because it makes them seem more likable or more popular. It's all about popularity. Like they're all worried about 
like if people care about them in that way. It's not just because of popularity, but also a chance at fame, something that many teens hope for. Because they just want to make a name for themselves, either if it's just for something idiotic, but they just want to make a name for themselves and just get known from other people. But why do they want this fame? Well, they have seen many social media stars build fortunes and empires through their social media platforms. But with this fame comes the dark side of social media, bullying. Hate comments that can lead to suicide. It's dumb, um, usually because you're behind a screen and you're just talking things about other people and you're, you seem like a coward because you're not saying it to the person straightforward, but sometimes it goes to the point where you're hurting that other people's feelings where it can lead to something drastic like suicide. But even with the possibility of being bullied, that doesn't I'm seem to keep teens away from social media platforms. For the report program, I am Victor Cholico. With people on their phones and other handheld devices more than ever, doctors have begun diagnosing people with a condition called text neck, which it was inspired by the art of one in residence at Cal State Fullerton's Grand Central Art Center. People are on their phones more than ever, with the average adult spending more than an hour and a half per day on their phones, and that number rising to five hours per day in young adults. David Pulitzer is an artist at Cal State Fullerton's Grand Central Art Center who is working on a project titled Text Neck that shows a different side of cell phones. The name comes from a, um, a diagnosable repetitive strain injury that doctors are uh, diagnosing people with more and more these days and it's, it comes from using a smartphone too much. Pulitzer's project is an assortment of experimental videos that bring awareness to how cell phones and technology shape our behavior in social situations. Along with the help of actors and other artists, Pulitzer is creating satirical scenes in public and recording the actors without any access to technology in a small hoop tent in his studio he calls the burrito. The outer exterior is made of this material that's meant to block out um, cell phone waves and Wi-Fi um, signals and Bluetooth. So the idea is that you go in there and you have no connection. You are forced to be um, present. The finished project will hopefully shed light on how often we use our phones and how deeply our dependence to them has become. If I can get the viewer to even just think, think twice about how they use their phones, then I think, I mean, I, I don't want to be on a soapbox and again, you know, it's, phones are bad, but because um, they're not, but I, I do think that we need to um, uh, just be conscious, you know. For the report program, I'm Matthew Kirkland. While Instagram is widely used in America, apps like Line and WeChat are popular in other countries. Our reporter, Miri Sonona, interviewed CSF, CSUF international students from different countries to find out more about the apps they choose to use. I use Line. Line is like a texting app. There are lots of people using it in Japan. Line is the free texting app that we can also share pictures, videos, and voice messages. The app has more than 70 million monthly active users in Japan and over 200 million monthly active users in worldwide. What attracts the huge number of users is one of their features, stickers and emojis. I really like this sticker. The app owns over 10,000 different types of stickers and emojis. The characters from LINE stickers are called LINE friends and Japan, Korea, Taiwan and even New York have their merchandise stores. On the other hand, in China, people are obsessed with the different social media app. In China, we always use the app with our social media is WeChat. It's just like Facebook, you can talk and share your photos with your friends. WeChat is the Chinese social media app that you can do pretty much everything, including sending money to people.
It became one of the largest standalone messaging apps by monthly active users with over 980 million monthly active users. It is uh, very common convinced for us to talk with our friends immediately. Through common social media apps like Facebook, you can be still connected with people in the world. But these foreign apps might give you opportunities to get to know them better. This is Miri Sonoda, an international student from Japan, reporting for the report program. Now, I will definitely say that I am guilty of being addicted to my social medias. Do you guys have any bad habits? Are you the same? I mean, I quit social media for like six months, oh. and then I got back on, so I think I'm actually addicted. Like, the whole time <laughs> I was like missing it really bad, but I got off, so. Yeah, but it's oh, that's more than I could do. Definitely. <laughs> but it's also part of our job as journalists. Like, we have to yeah. keep up yeah. with Twitter and all that, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, but that's going to be it for this week's class edition of the report program. Thanks for watching and be sure to tune in uh, for future episodes of our show. To view previous installments, go to our Titan TV YouTube channel. Have a great day and see you next week, Titans. Press up again. <laughs>